Uh, this is chapter 11. It's integer programming. Uh, the basic idea of, of integer programming that makes it different from uh, linear programming is that at least one x of j is an integer. How is that on the screen? It's got the board. It doesn't have you, though. They don't need you. Well, that's OK. Yeah. I, well, I know it doesn't have me. I'm on this side, so. Ah, that's good. So, OK. Um, integer programming is essentially broken into three different categories. There's pure, mixed, and binary, which are, yeah, pip, mip, bip. Sounds like the sound effects from Atari's Pong. Uh, if it's pure integer programming, all of the decision variables are uh, integers. If it's mixed, some, but not all, xj are integers. And if it's binary, all xj are equal to 0 or 1. So before we get into some formulation examples, we're actually doing something a little out of order compared to when I typically do it. Um, to give you an idea of, of sample size here in terms of the, uh, the objective, uh, sorry, the, uh, not the objective function of the uh, feasible region, uh, if you, or the potential sample space here. Let's say that you've got 10 binary decision variables. Possible solutions are there? Two to the ten. That was in twenty-four. Computer science major. Okay, so turns out we add another variable, decision variable, then the Space of possible solutions goes up to 2048. Yeah, okay. The basic idea here is that the um, solution set has uh, two to the n um, elements if it has. In binary decision variables. Which essentially means is, uh, that if you were to actually evaluate every single possible element in that solution set, and then you were to add another variable, the process or the rate of growth of the sample space would end up being twice as big. It would be an exponential function. Okay. You may or may 
know, some of you have definitely heard the term P versus not uh, NP, right? Polynomial versus non-polynomial. When we look at a number of algorithms, uh, if something is determined to be NP, and there's a distinction that we'll get to called NP complete versus NP hard, uh, the basic thing is that the time required to solve the problem using a computer grows exponentially, if it's NP, um, based on, on some exponential fu uh, some function here. So as the problem gets bigger and bigger and bigger, essentially it's taking longer and longer and longer to solve it, and the thought is that once you get past a certain size, you're just not going to be able to solve it anymore. So one of the things that we're going to look at in this chapter uh, is to look at ways to take algorithms and then use other methods that we've already done to essentially make the sample space smaller so that we can evaluate it in parts and not actually have to enumerate this entire set. That's something we're going to have to be concerned with. And you really have to be concerned with any large problem, but uh, with the integer programming ones, it becomes even bigger. And, and you can imagine that for a pure problem, it's going to be even that much bigger because your base is all of a sudden larger than two. Okay. So um, let's take a, take a look at a couple of these here. Uh, this first one, which is on page 524. to divide their main household chores, marketing, cooking, dishwasher, dishwashing, and laundry. You can tell one of the authors is British. Marketing. Okay. They're not going out selling products. They're going to the store. <laughs> That's the British term. Uh, between them so that each has two tasks, but the total time they spend on household duties is kept to a minimum. Their efficiencies on these tasks differ where the time each would need to perform the task is given by the following table. So, we've got Eve, we've got Stephen. Uh, this is time needed per week, and all of them start with different letters. So, marketing, cooking, dishwashing, and laundry. These are all in hours. 4.5, 4.9, 7.8, 7.2, 7.3, 7.4, 4.3, and 3.9. And what we need to do is to formulate a binary integer uh, programming model for this problem. So uh, as far as this is concerned, minimax. Min, min. We're going to have to do this in the shortest amount of time. So we're going to minimize z. Now, before we start putting these things in here, the decision variables. Basically, what are the decisions we have to make? Yeah, whether Eve or Stephen does one of the other chores. Okay, yeah, whether we assign a task to one or the other. Yeah, to a specific person. So. This is one of those places where having double subscripts comes in handy. Uh, we'll let xij equal 0, I'm sorry, we'll equal 1 if uh, task j is assigned to person i and 0 otherwise. We'll 
let Eve be one and we'll let Stephen be two. So we're going to have I being one or two and J one through four. So as far as the objective function is concerned, um, we're going to have the appropriate xij's uh, preceded by the amount of time. So 4.5x11 plus 7.8x12 plus 3.6x13 plus 2.9x14 plus 4.9x21 plus 7.2x22 plus 4.3x23 plus 3.1x24. variables and make it one minus the other? That's something we're going to talk about, yes. Yes, we will. Um, that works very well as far as the objective function is concerned. But don't forget, we still have constraints. Okay? So, in some cases, that's a great idea. And in some cases, it will work just fine. In case you didn't hear that, the question was, can we replace the bottom four with one minus the appropriate x, i, j? And in some cases that will work, and why am I shouting? Um, and in some cases it won't, so. Okay. Now. In terms of assigning the tasks, when we went through the problem, um, what was one thing in terms of the way the tasks were divided? Yeah. Each has to have two? Each has to have two. Okay. So if Eve has to have two, what would be the appropriate constraint for that one? All the uh, x sub ij associated with the has to, has to equal two. The the x ij's associated one? with her associated with the her. Some of that has to equal two. Right. So basically, the x the sum of the x one j's. Mm -hmm. So we've got the sum j equals one to four of x one j is equal to two. And the same thing where what's replaced with what? Right, the one's replaced with two. Four of x two j that has to equal two. Is that everything we need? Or there are other things, other restrictions that we have to make sure we meet. It to be at least 24 hours. Okay. Yeah, and we'll, so, or actually a week, right? Yeah, it's, a week. it's a week. So, but we don't, we, we've all got, since all of those are put in in hours per week, we're okay there. Okay. Okay, we definitely. Yeah, well, we'll get that with the binary, but there's there's something else. Do you want to make sure that they're not both the same task? Right. Okay. You know, if you look at this, if this is all we had with the binary thrown in, I can tell you what the optimal solution is right now. <laughs> they're both assigned the dishwashing and the laundry, and nobody's going to go to the, get the food or do whatever the heck C was. <laughs> the cooking. Nobody's going to get the food, nobody's going to cook it. 
They'll be clean, but they'll be starving. <laughs> okay? So we need to make sure that, that all of the tasks are assigned. How can we, how can we do that? We could do that. Um, think about it from the, you know, when we start thinking about the algorithms, you know, the saying the not equal to, that starts to become problematic as far as the algorithm. No, I, I was going to say something about wrong. I'll say what I was going to say anyway. I was going to suggest that x1, 1 minus x2, 1 must equal 0, but that's not right. Okay, um, but, but you're getting warmer. Yeah, great. That's a little too general because we still have the we still have the issue that we could give um, who's the same J. So I'll change line around, but this sum should equal one. There we go. X one one plus X two one equals one. X uh, 1, 2 plus x2, 2 equals 1. x1, 3 plus x2, 3 equals 1. And x1, 4 plus x2, 4 equals 1. And then xij is binary. all IJ pairs. But isn't that by definition already? Hmm? Isn't that by definition already or oh we defined it that way, but in terms of programming, when you think about the mod we'll put in a statement that will make these binary. As a matter of fact, in a moment, we will. I'm just going to let it boot up. So, okay. Um, it, it's, it's like the non negativity. Once we've got this, we don't have to worry about the non negativity. It's redundant there. I, I realize this is redundant with this. Um, it's just from the standpoint that if we had a problem that had um, different sets of possible values, not just all binary, uh, we'd need that there. So, yeah, the redundancy is, is you're correct about the redundancy in this case, but just better to get in the habit. So, we also yeah. never defined an operation before. You say it's binary. So you can't get, just by saying that it's either zero or one. If you have one plus one, you're not going to say one. But in binary, you define that operation so that it's zeros. We're not talking about binary in the computer science sense. Yeah, we really are actually. It's it's because if we add one and one, we'll get two, not one zero. No, but if we're only using singletons, one plus one equals zero. This is good. We should get the camera up here, let you two go at it for a while. So, no, it's, it's, it's a valid point. I mean, it's that binary clock where you've got 0 and 1 and 12 and 6, and you just keep doing that. I, I, I certainly understand the point. Um, it, it's, it's well taken. Um, okay, well, let's bring up lingo. Um, hey, producer. Yeah. Okay, while that's uh, brightening, I'll just go ahead and type it in here.
My biggest concern is that you see how to do this. So, under search. Some of you found this earlier in the semester, but basically what you're going to need at the bottom of the model. Everything else is done the same way. If it's a general integer value, then you're going to do at gen. Okay. If that if that's the case, so let's let's say that you've got a variable that's um, that's an integer and you know that its maximum is going to be five, or the, the possible maximum is five, then what you would have is you would have the at gen and then the variable name in parentheses. You would not need, uh, you would need the non-negativity because if it's at gen, that doesn't guarantee that it can't be a negative. Um, and then you would need the constraint for that variable being less than or equal to five. So you would need that as a functional constraint. So you can see that in terms of the modeling is concerned, it's going to add a bunch of constraints. With the binary, you don't have to worry about that. The at binary makes it automatically so it's at bin for the binary stuff. The, um, the version of Lingo that you're using, the, the student demo, limits the number of binary variables that you can use. It, eliminate, it, it limits the number of general and integer variables you can use. So um, I was careful with the homework to make sure that you don't have one that you can't do with the software. Okay. But that's, that's where you're going to go about it. You've seen me type stuff into Lingo. It's just, it just literally all you're going to have um, down here is something like that. Um, OK. So it'll be at the end, like after the constraints? Yeah, you'll have, you'll have one for each one. Unfortunately, you can't do it as a vector. So the, the big thing is put one in and then copy and paste and then just go change your, your subscripts. Okay? Um, and for the first time, because when you've done all the LP problems, it basically took one iteration. When you pulled up the Lingo Solver and it showed you how many iterations it would take. With the binary variables, it's going to actually take iterations. You're going to see fives and sixes and sevens because of the size of the problem. Okay. So they're still small enough that, that it'll run, it will run quickly, but that's how that works. Okay? Okay. Um, next one. This is 1-6 uh, on that same page. It says, uh, Vincent Cardoza is the, I should get the light off behind me. That should be fun on the camera. So, 
Uh, Vincent Cardoza is the owner and manager of a machine shop that does custom work. This Wednesday afternoon, he has received calls from two customers who would like to place rush orders. One is a trailer hitch company which would like some custom made heavy duty tow bars. The other is a mini car carrier company which needs some customized stabilizer bars. Both customers would like as many as possible by the end of the week, two working days. Since both products would require the use of the same two machines, Vincent needs to decide and inform the customers this afternoon uh, about how many of each product he will agree to make over the next two days. Uh, each tow bar requires 3.2 hours on machine one and two hours on machine two. Best impromptu recording of the lecture goes to. Uh, that's okay. So this is 3.2 hours. This is two hours. And this is for those watching at home 1 6. Um, each stabilizer bar. Uh, 2.4 on machine one, three on machine two. Machine one will be available for 16 hours over the next two days. Machine two will be available for 15 hours. Profit for each tow bar produced would be $130. Profit for each stabilizer bar would be $150. So Vincent now wants to determine the mix of these production quantities that will maximize the total profit. We're doing an IP model uh, because it's not just an issue of making one tow bar or none or one stabilizer bar or none. Um, so how many decision variables? Two. Okay. So x1 is the number of tow bars made. X2 is the number of stabilizer bars made. That's a profit. So we want to maximize Z. And <coughs> the formula for Z is going to be. 30x1 plus 150x2. How many functional constraints? Two. Just two, right? For the two machines. So for machine one, 3.2x1 plus 2.4x2 has to be less than or equal to 16. And then, wait, did I erase something? I think I did. I used stuff. Uh, 2.4. No. You're right. 
I was right? Okay. Thanks. That's what happens when I spend five days at home. I'm not right anymore. Okay, so for the second one, 2x1 plus 3x2 less than or equal to 15. Okay. Um, we do need the non-negativity constraints here. So x1 greater than or equal to 0, x2 greater than or equal to 0, and then uh, x1 and x2 are integers. This is looking a heck of a lot like an LP model, except for that, right? So you know, one thing, without getting into the more formal methods, is sometimes you think, well, what I can do is let's go ahead and drop that constraint, run it, and see if we get lucky. With textbooks, you might get lucky. With reality, eh. <laughs> this, you know, primarily because the problem is going to be a heck of a lot bigger around to the nearest signatures. Okay. Sometimes that works. Okay, and, and that's there's a term for that. It starts with an H. Anybody who's done any programming should have heard of this term before. Heuristic. Heuristic, yeah. A heuristic. Okay. So heuristics heuristics are are methods of solving something that aren't guaranteed to work, but they sound like good ideas, and in a lot of cases, they will end up working for you. The problem with it is that you aren't guaranteed you know, that you found the best one. In two dimensions, it's usually pretty easy, but start taking this to seven or eight dimensions, and you think about what the, the um, feasible region looks like, and, What's the closest at that point? It's, it's a lot harder to visualize. So, um, but but you can get an idea um, with this one. Okay. Any questions? to these standard types of problems, uh, there are some other types of I get a second chance. I'm getting closer. You know, I've rehabbed it. Yeah, that's. I think Nicole's worried that I'm going to hit her. You saw the lean. Yeah, I saw the lean. You didn't have to agree. Okay. Third time's the charm, right? Uh, other types of decisions. Hey, there we go. See, this is the part that's more fun about taping in front of a live studio audience. Okay. Um, one, uh, one other type is where you have mutually exclusive alternatives. So in 
that situation, only one decision in the group is yes. So it may be a situation where you've got some additional money to make an additional product. You've got three products in your product line that you can make, but you're only going to start up one. Which one are you going to start up? So we essentially have a zero one variable where within the different uh, constraints and within the objective function, one of them is going to be one and the others are going to be zero to imply which one gets turned on. The other thing that can happen is that you can have contingent decisions. So these depend on previous decisions. In a routing problem, it's also called a shipment problem, you're talking about different routes that something can take. At the point where you've got to make your third turn, choosing which street you go on at the point you make your third turn depends upon what street you turned on to with your first and your second turn. That's an example of a contingent decision. So again, uh, only certain things are going to be possible, and you're going to have binary variables in there. Um, so in addition to the types of problems that we had in those examples, uh, some other applications. Site selection. Uh, designing. distribution network, so things about uh, where do we put plants, uh, do we close something or not, uh, do we ship site I from center J. This week, that type of example is a huge one, right? Because of figuring out where the tankers can go to gas stations that are actually in operation that have the electricity. Or which, you know, which grocery stores have enough electricity or enough backup to be able to keep things from going bad. Uh, route selection. Activity scheduling. And crew scheduling. Would you like to be the person in charge of crew scheduling at LaGuardia? Or better yet, Kennedy and Newark. It's not too tough yet, they're still closed. So those are some different examples. Types of problems. Then you've got some variations. Things like either or constraints. Either, either or situation, uh, you've got two constraints uh, 
but only one must hold. So let's say you've got the following two constraints that are just made up. Either 10x1 plus 12x2 is less than or equal to 90, or um, 3x1 plus 7x2 is less than or equal to 58. So in, in a situation like this, uh, we can turn two constraints into four. So this is two to four. We've got either 10x1 plus 12x2 is less than or equal to 90 and 3x1 plus 7x2 is less than or equal to 58 plus m. That same big M that we talked about. Or, what do you think is going to be on the other side of the or? Yes. What's It'll be the, the same statement, but the big M will be with the 90. Right. We're just moving the M. Now, William, which you brought up earlier. This is one of those places where the one minus comes in handy. Because we just took two constraints and turned them into four. So we've increased the dimensionality of the problem this way rather substantially. You also had to not make the or constraints. Right. So how about this? Um, instead, we have 10x1 plus 12x2 less than or equal to 90. I'm going to add something over here. So we're just writing the original constraints first. 3x1 plus 7x2 less than or equal to 58. We're going to add an m on both of those. But now, we'll put another variable y in here. The second one will make it 1 minus y, where y is binary. If y is 0, the first constraint holds, and the second constraint automatically holds. If y is 1, the second constraint holds, the first one will automatically Okay? So what we've done here is instead of increasing the number of constraints, effectively we added one variable, one binary variable to take care of this issue. Everybody good on that? point of going through that first is to recognize you wouldn't want to. So 
just going through and seeing all of that is essentially telling you you don't want to worry about trying to program it that way, but this is the easier way to do it. So the simple answer is get to the viewers. So, um, the next situation is a K out of the N constraints. Must hold. So we're just generalizing what we just did in the previous case. Because in the previous case, the values of k and n were what and what? 1 and 2. Okay. So now we're just going to take this to having more constraints and, and generalizing how many of them must hold. So for the purpose of the functional constraints, uh, originally, we'll just write them this way. Uh, f1 of the vector x is less than or equal to d1, f2 of x is less than or equal to d2, down through f sub capital N of x is less than or equal to d sub n. So those are our original n constraints, cap n. K out of n of those must hold. So can we do the y and the 1 minus y in this case? No, that's only going to work with 2, right? The n is 2. Um, but we're still able to use a binary variable. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn these into the following. We're going to tack on, we'll let's see it with the first one and then get the general idea. So our new version of the first constraint, the right-hand side, is D1 plus cap M uh, times Y1. For F2, less than or equal to D2 plus cap M of Y2 down through F sub N of X is less than or equal to D sub N plus cap M of Y sub N. reminding you from earlier on in the course. These subscripts right here, are those I's or J's? Think about the functional constraints back in the LP problems, the right-hand sides. Were those I's or J's? J. J. Hmm? J. The J's were the decision variables. So if you go back to the objective function, it was c sub j, c sub j times x sub j, and then we had the i's. So these, these are the i's right here. Okay, so as far as this is concerned, for the ones where the constraint holds, what's the value of the, the corresponding y sub i? It's going to be zero, right? We need the stricter one, right? Okay, so if you were to sum up i equals 1 to cap n of y sub i, if for the ones that hold, it's 0. The ones where it doesn't hold, it's 1. What should that sum be equal to? Minus K. Cap N minus K.
k of them are zeros, n minus k of them are ones, hence you add up n minus k ones and k zeros, you get n minus k. And then you've got the uh, yi. Everybody good on that? Set up costs. Fixed charges. Where have we done set up costs this semester? Last week. Last week. Okay, the inventory theory stuff. So when you think about um, set up costs, let's call it F sub J. Of x of j is equal to kj plus cj xj when xj is greater than zero and zero when xj is equal to zero. Why can't we put the or equal to in there? What's, what's the problem that would exist if we threw the or equal to in here? Because there's a penis. Sorry, I just saw the hand first. Yeah. Oh, because it's zero if it's equal to zero. Zero if it's equal to zero. That doesn't disappear, right? Okay. So essentially what this is saying is you can't do this as a linear program. Okay. Um, so essentially, what you end up having, if z is simply a function of your setup costs, uh, uh, your fixed costs and your, your purchasing costs, then you can look at this as being z uh, is equal to the sum, j equals 1 to n, of cj xj plus kj, yj, where yj is equal to either 1 or 0. yj is going to be equal to 1 when what's true? xj is greater than 0. It's going to be zero if xj is equal to zero. This is an example of a contingent decision. That's not the model, right? That's just defining what yj will be. So how do we guarantee this? Well, we guarantee it by adding another constraint. So as far as the functional constraint is concerned, 
Um, remember, if xj is greater than zero, what we want is we want yj to be equal to one. If xj is equal to zero, then we want yj to be equal to zero. Can xj be more than one? If you're thinking about it from a production size or an order size, number of units you're ordering, something like that, it can certainly be more than one, right? Okay. okay. Un unless the problem is, you know, the Navy ordering nuclear submarines, we're not talking zero one here. Okay. So this. Is that going to work? That's not going to work, right? Okay. It will certainly work in that case, right? It holds there, but it doesn't necessarily hold there. Okay. So since we don't have a restriction on how large this can go, what could we do to that side to guarantee that this will always be less than or equal to that in this situation. I'm sorry, I honestly don't get why we, we need a constraint like that in the first place. Okay. We need a constraint to guarantee this relationship. We're just defining this, but we need to put a constraint into the model so that yj is guaranteed to be 1 when xj is positive, and that it's guaranteed to be 0 when xj is 0. Yeah. Can, can you add xj to the other side? Um, that's an interesting thought. Um, the Um, but the problem with that is that if xj is positive, this could be zero. It could be that way. Uh, oh, wait a second. If you, you said add xj to this. Yeah, your okay. only problem is the zero case. Yeah, the zero case. If you put, if you add xj to this, then this become then subtract xj from both sides. This becomes yj is greater than zero, and that's not strong enough. Okay, but think about what we've done a lot of today. Okay, add m to to the right hand side. Okay, but not add m. Multiply by m. If yj, if xj is 0, yj has to be 0. If xj is positive, yj has to be 1. And then it always holds. Okay. So it can be written right like that. For the purpose of putting it into lingo, uh, it's usually easier to do it this way. xj minus m times yj is less than or equal to zero. xj is an integer and yj is binary. Right. Well, xj, yes, in this case, I, we didn't say that we had to, to do integer. Oh, shoot. Sorry. Um, we can do this regardless of whether uh, that it's integer. Yeah, if we're ordering stuff, if we can order fractional unit, units. Um, but yj is definitely binary. But yj definitely has to be binary, right? So.
I, I, I know. I know technically we're still ordering whole units, but it was funny while I was out and people were preparing for the hurricane, I figured it would be a good time to go buy a pumpkin ale. So I went into the liquor store and I saw a lot of my students at <laughs> Monster <laughs> Beverage. So, you know, are, are fifths really fractional units? And yeah, it's the whole bottle, but it's a fifth. It sounds like something George Carlin would have pondered in a certain state in his life at this point. So, I hope you had the camera off for that. <laughs> I'll edit that out. Uh, so, okay, um, we're done. It's six o'clock, so you can go back.